Okay, so as promised, I want to show you the proof of the uniqueness of solutions. So I'm writing down the heat equation with a very generic condition here. So uh, let's say uh, you have a heat equation for positive T and your X is between 0 to L. So in this domain, uh, this heat equation is satisfied and then if you plug in 0 into x or L into x you end up with a function of t only because t is still there, right? Uh, now we only did the case when the, the both endpoints are fixed at 0 but uh, today I also want to show you what happens when these are uh, some more complicated ones, okay? And then uh, you have ux0 as f of x, which is when time t equals to 0, that's the initial state of the heat, heat distribution on the rod. Okay? So if you have all this, uh, and let's say you, you solved it. I mean, we, we did solve an, an example, right? So uh, because we have a solution that satisfies all of these, uh, we already have existence. Okay? Now the question is, even if we, we solved a heat equation like this, is that the only solution? We don't know because the way we solved it was basically guessing. You started with some uh, things that would satisfy the few conditions that you have and then using those building blocks you added them up to make it forced to satisfy the initial condition. That's called the separation of variables. So if you use se separation of variables to solve a heat equation like this, you really don't know if there are some other solutions because you're not really truly solving it, you're just guessing it. Okay? So now the question is, if you want to say that that's the only solution, you have to show that if you have a solution of such a thing, it cannot be anything different. It has to be that one. So uh, the way we go about it is, let's assume that, assume u1 xt and u2 xt both solve the above. Okay. Uh, let's say u1, if you plug it in, it satisfies the heat equation, it satisfies the boundary conditions, it satisfies the initial condition, and there's u2 that also does the same. Now, we would be done showing that uh, the solution is unique if we can show that u1 is equal to u2. Agreed? Right. Okay, then what we do is we set vxt as the difference between the two functions. Okay. Uh, and to show that these two are equal, we have to show that vxt must be? Not zero. Zero. Yeah, always zero. zero. Yeah. Yeah. If, if v is always zero, then this and this has to be equal. That's how you, you do it. Okay. But now, look what this was satisfied. See, if you, if you differentiate t, so if you differentiate v by t, that's the same thing as ut, u1t, sorry, u1t. Uh, and u2t, but because u1 and u2 both satisfy this, it's going to be k times u1xx minus k times u2xx, but that's going to be the same thing as uh, k times vxx, because if you took this and you differentiate it twice by x, that's like u1xx minus u2xx. So what does that say? It says that V must also satisfy the heat equation. So, so this thing says Vt must be equal to K times Vxx. Okay? Now what about V of 0t? Well, that's U1 0t minus U2 0t. Now, what's u1, 0t? 
U1 satisfies everything in here. So U1, 0, T will be G of T. It will be this one, right? So it must be G of T. Now U2 also satisfies everything here. So U2, 0, T would be G of T as well, right? But then what's that? Zero. Now, don't you see that the same exact thing will happen if you were to calculate V of LT? It will be H of T minus H of T, so it will be zero. Okay? And then this one also. V of X comma zero would be U1 of X comma zero minus U2 X comma zero equals to F of X minus F of X which is zero. So these are the equations or conditions that V must satisfy. We know that V of T should equal to K times VXX. V of zero T should equal to, to zero. V of LT should equal to zero. V of X comma zero should equal to zero. All of these. Now, uh, then it remains us to prove that anything that satisfies this must be exactly zero. The only function that would satisfy all of all three conditions is just zero. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, for all of these uniqueness solutions, it relies on finding something that is either constant. Yes. So I don't understand the first line. And of this y k x k u one x s minus k u two x s equals to k v x. Oh, uh, this one? This one? The first one. Top. Yeah, top. Th this one? Yeah, and the rest equal. Oh, oh, oh uh, okay. So if you want to revisit that one, let me let me try this again. What was our definition of v? V was u one minus u two, right? Okay. Now. What does u1 satisfy? If you differentiate by t, it should be ku xx, right? Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. u2, if you differentiate by t, it should be same as differentiating twice in x and multiplying by k, right? So this subscript means you differentiate, right? You, uh, this two just means uh, the second function, so it has a different functionality, it might be confusing you, sorry. But we know that, and then, now let's think about this V. If you differentiate V by T, differentiation is linear, right? Differentiating V by T is same as differentiating U1 by T and U2 by T. But now we can also take this and differentiate both sides twice by X. Second derivative is also linear, right? So you have u1xx minus u2xx. Now you multiply by k, but then what is this? This is same as this, this is same as this, so this must be same as that. That's why this is true. Okay. Uh, I mean, what actually happens is that if you have any linear PDE, then difference of two solutions will again solve the same, same PDE. The boundary conditions might be different, uh, but this is something that will ha happen all the time. All right? So do we agree? Yep. Okay, so as long as we show that the only uh, V that satisfies this is zero, uh, we are done with the proof, right? And uh, the way we prove such a thing is you, we find out something that's conserved or something that decreases. Uh, in this case, uh, we define something called the energy, which is not truly the energy, actually. Uh, uh, so in heat equation, the energy stored in the, the system is proportional to the total heat. So it, the, the actual energy should be just integral of V, but uh, it's customary to 
call in PDEs anything, something that's, that's squared then you're integrating, they, they customarily call this as energy. Uh, and I want to show that this is a non-increasing quantity. How? Well, let's differentiate this. Let's do a partial derivative. Oh, not t. dx. Okay. Let's do a partial derivative with respect to x. No, with, with res respect to t. Then, uh, actually, let me take that back. See, v is a function of x and t, and you're integrating by x. So now, after you plug in 0 and l to that antiderivative, what you get is a function of t only, right? So you can see that this, this quantity only depends on t. You agree? If you have a function of x and t, and you integrate by one of the variables, then it only depends on the other one. Okay? Now you want to differentiate this by t, so d dt, which means you have to differentiate this by t. And uh, because this is an integration by x and it has nothing to do with t, I can bring this inside. And if you differentiate v squared by the chain rule, this is uh, v squared differentiates to 2v, but then you pull the inside function out and differentiate, which is vt. That's what you get. Right? Okay. Now, which one of these can we use over here? What do you think? It works like magic. I mean, it, once you define the correct thing, then everything just follows. See this? Vt is kvxx. Okay? So I can replace this by 2 times v kvt vxx kvxx dx. So I can bring the 2k outside, just write 0 to L of v times vxx. Right? Okay. Now we do integration by parts. What is integration by parts? You take one of them, you integrate only one of them, right? So if we integrate vxx by x, what do we get? Vx. Just vx, because this is the second derivative. If you, if you integrate, it just becomes the first derivative, right? So this becomes 2k v, vx, and you plug in l and 0, okay. minus, 2k is still there, uh, 0 to l. Now, the one that you did not integrate in the next stage becomes differentiated, right? So this one we differentiate by x. Okay, now if you plug in 0 into x or l into x, regardless of the value of, of t, this will give you 0, right? So when l goes into v and 0 goes into v, they both give you 0, so you end up with negative 2k, 0 to l, vx squared dx. And by the way, uh, if the boundary conditions were Neumann condition where you have vx, vx there, in that case, you, this part will also become zero. So, although I'm only showing you for the Dirichlet condition, the same proof holds for the Neumann condition as well, right? Okay, so you have this, and uh, now here, here's the thing. vx squared is something that's non-negative, non right? So, this is a non-negative quantity, and it has a negative sign in front. K is always positive, right? Uh, so that means that this is a quantity that's non-negative. Okay. 
Agreed? Okay. Now, let's think about what e of 0 is. e of 0 is integral from 0 to L of v of x comma 0, this thing squared dx. But what is uh, vx 0? It's 0, right? So it's the integral of 0 to L of 0 squared dx, which is 0. OK? So you have e of 0 and 0, and you know that e prime is less or equal to 0, which means it cannot increase. OK? So what does that mean? That, that e of t must be? It will always be 0, right? Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, we also know that uh, E is always non-negative because uh, it, it's 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 an integral of something squared. Okay, so E cannot go less than zero, but it cannot be increasing. So what what other choice does it have other than just being always zero? Okay, so these two imply that E of t must be zero all the time. But now let's go back and see what that means. If this is always 0, if, so if this is always 0, then what does that tell us? If e of t is always 0, this implies that v of t must be, v of x t must be, 0. zero. Because if you have any point that's not 0, that squares give you some positive value. So when you integrate it, it will be a non-zero value. Oh, by the way, uh, you might ask, what if it, it's like non-zero only at one point? Because integration doesn't care about one point being different. But then uh, the heat equation here forces the function to be differentiable at least once, which means if, you, if it's differentiable, we know that it's continuous, right? So if it's non-zero at any point, then by continuity, it has to be non-zero over a neighborhood. So that would immediately imply that E of t is non-zero which can't happen. So the only way that, that uh, e of t is 0 would be when v of x t is always 0. So that shows that u1 is equal to, so, so as we claim, this means that u1 is equal to u2, and therefore uniqueness is proved. Okay? That's how it works.